Hi, welcome to today's webinar on compressed air. My name is Steve Kosky. All of PGE's seminars and webinars are in part sponsored by the Energy Trust of Oregon. We work together to make sure the concepts and recommendations you learn in our events are consistent across all of our individual programs and services. Now to get us started, let's go ahead and remark this slide up that was up at the beginning. Uh, give us a feel for the size and type of compressed air systems you guys are operating. Uh, use one of the markup tools over on the left side of the screen. You can use the highlighter. Yep, this a rectangle box or whatever you like. I'm pretty sure I saw a centrifugal over there earlier, which is good. We have a Yeah, the the arrow tool kind of it changes, so you only get one arrow at a time. That's the only drawback on that one. Okay. So excellent. So some some people without a system, some uh, medium large systems, some oil-free, oil-flooded screws, and some centrifugals, so that's great. Thank you. So here's our basic path today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that pop up or, you know, chase any items of interest that you guys come up with. So don't hesitate to use the raise hand function in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, or you can type in a question to Beth and she'll ask me. Uh, the more questions you guys ask, the more this will be relevant to you, and the more it'll help you save energy, which is what we're we're after. And Steve, I just wanted to say um, there is no raise hand icon anymore in this new interface, so um, just feel free to text me your questions through chat. And to get the chat window, just click on the chat icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Thanks. Ah, uh, thanks, Beth. Yeah, it would be really great if everyone could uh, come up with a question or two during today's webinar. All right, first we're going to talk about how great compressed air is and why we find it almost everywhere. Then we're going to talk about the drawbacks and some fundamental inefficiencies. And next we'll go through a generic list of ways to save energy on any system. Then we'll spend the bulk of our time on five case studies where folks cleaned up their compressed air systems and saved energy. Now, some of these case studies are the same ones you heard uh, during the small industrial webinar, if you tuned into that one an hour ago. But the, the final case study on centrifugals is different, so if, you're, if you deal with centrifugal systems, you'll want to stick around for that one. And at the end, we'll point you towards some technical resources and sum up. So to start out, compressed air is it's everywhere because it's so wonderful. It can do about anything you can think of. It can push, pull, carry, cool, stir, dry, and disappear. It's uh, very simple to connect. It won't shock you. It works in wet and corrosive locations. And compressed air actuators are inexpensive, light, and small. And one of the best things is that compressed air spills are self-cleaning. In fact, compressed air is so great that 10% of all the electricity generated in the United States goes to air compressors, which is kind of an amazing fraction, amazingly high. At least when I first heard it, I couldn't believe it. And seven in 10 industrial sites have compressed air. All right, so it's so versatile and simple and it's everywhere. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that is the air is very compressible, which means that when we compress it, a lot of the energy turns into heat. So let's all do a little thought experiment. Uh, reach out in front of your body and grab about a gallon of air between your hands. Now imagine squishing that gallon down to the size of a pint. So that's an eight to one compression, and that would give you about 100 PSI. Now if you could do this and not let any heat escape, how hot would that pint of air be? 
So using the text tool, type your guess somewhere on the screen. Now, if you attended the small industrial webinar this morning, I want you to, to stay out of this one because I don't want to ruin all the answers. So let's go ahead, everyone who's new to this webinar, go ahead and take a guess at what the temperature of your air would be after you compressed it down to a pint. And yeah, if you're using the text tool, after you type in your, your number, you need to click somewhere else and that will make it appear for the rest of us. Or you can just use the marker tool and just write it on the screen. There we go. 100, 190, 400, 200, 400, 300. All right, those are all good guesses. Our pint is 500 degrees if we don't let any heat escape, which that seems, you know, come on, it can't be 500 degrees. Well, why isn't it 500 degrees? Why aren't, aren't our pipes and tanks and hoses and everything, you know, nearly glowing at 500 degrees? Well, we've thrown away all the heat of compression and for oil flooded compressors, this is mostly going to be thrown away in the oil coolers. And for oil free compressors, this is going to be thrown away in intercoolers and after coolers. 85% of our compressor power is turned into heat. So this means a 100 horsepower compressor makes 85 horsepower of heat, but only 15 horsepower of usable air power. And that's a best case. It could be worse. So another way to think of an air compressor is a fancy heater that makes some compressed air as a byproduct. To get 15 horsepower of air to the shop floor for a year, it would take $50,000 in air compressor power, or it would only take about $7,500 with a 15 horse electric motor. So what is the lesson here? The lesson is that compressed air is expensive to make, so we want to use it carefully and we want to make it efficiently. Now we have a list of uh, fairly generic energy saving concepts that could be applied to almost any, any system where we're trying to save energy, whether it's lighting, irrigation, refrigeration, uh, and our first concept on the list is uh, minimize loads. So with compressed air, this is going to be reducing the, you know, the total compressed air usage. If this was refrigeration, it would mean reducing the heat load. If it was pumping, we'd be trying to reduce the total gallons of water that we had to pump. Uh, number two, use your best part load option. Most equipment is pretty efficient when operated at full capacity at 100%. But the efficiency can drop off radically when we need only 50% capacity or 20% capacity. Uh, thankfully, there are many times there are alternate ways to control a piece of equipment so that when it's at low capacity, its efficiency is still good. It might not be as good, but it's, it's still acceptable. Uh, number three, turn it off. This is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if we don't need a system on or if we can get idle equipment shut down, then let's, let's do that. Uh, minimize pressure drops. Sometimes we'll have a, a bad actor with a high pressure drop, which basically forces us to operate at higher pressure in order to compensate. This could be a plug filter, some old undersized piping that was never upgraded, or a variety of things. Uh, optimize pressure settings. So for our compressed air users, we need enough pressure to uh, have them work properly, but excess pressure just increases compressor power and it also increases leak flow. Uh, number six, keep idling time to a minimum. This is kind of related to number three, turn it off. We can't instantly shut off most compressors, but we can use the automatic controls to shut the compressors off automatically and allow them to restart you know, automatically when they're needed. Um, number seven, right technology. So from time to time, we see someone using the wrong technology for the job. 
And this can this usually causes the system to be just fundamentally inefficient and use more power than is really necessary. So one example is using a desiccant dryer to provide you know super dry air when it's really not needed. Or another example would be using uh, you know cheap tubing fittings that end up developing a lot of leaks over time. Uh, right size equipment. So undersized equipment won't get the job done, and you know plants are pretty good about buying more air compressors if the plant air pressure is chronically low. So undersizing isn't typically the problem. But occasionally we find systems that are much larger than needed. Uh, either it was just purchased, it was just spec'd out too large, or the plant operation has changed and now they're using much less compressed air than they did years ago. And this can force them to operate in a really low efficiency, low capacity mode. Uh, number nine, remove barriers to more efficient set points. Uh, that's fairly self-explanatory. If there's something that's forcing us to run higher air pressure, maybe we can clean that thing up. Maybe we can fix that thing and run a more efficient set point. And the last one here, make the most of your controls. So often systems have efficient controls already in place that just aren't being used. And if they don't have the controls, you know, installing controls is often the cheapest and uh, most economical way to save energy, especially when it's compared with like an expensive equipment replacement. So now let's step into some upgrade case studies that range from small to large. And we're going to start off with a shop air situation where they were operating a 75-horse oil-flooded screw compressor rated at 330 CFM. And you'll notice that this guy is only averaging 31% capacity, so it's not highly loaded. And it's also being served by a desiccant dryer with no purge controls, and this dryer is rated at 550 CFM. And when we see mismatched, oversized, and you know, misapplied equipment like this, it's it's often used equipment that was purchased for you know pennies on the dollar. And the problem is that the initial purchase price of the equipment ends up being you know like less than 10% of the total cost of ownership over the life of the equipment. So getting a screaming deal or even getting free equipment that's the wrong size or the wrong type is often a very expensive mistake. And I'm sure you guys have seen examples of that in your lines of work. So first, let's talk about inlet modulation. This type of control basically just adjusts the inlet valve to the compressor so that the you know amount of flow that the system is using, the amount of compressed air flow the system is using, matches the uh, flow that we're letting go into the compressor. And this can be really efficient. This can be, this can be just fine on a base-loaded compressor or a compressor that's operating near full load because we're near, you know, we're at 100 percent capacity and we're near 100 percent power. But at low load, it's very inefficient. We use a lot of extra power. So here at 70 percent capacity, I mean at zero percent capacity, we're using you know, about 70% power, so not very good at the bottom end. And, you know, at the middle end, we're still using, you know, 85% capacity to get 50% flow out of this compressor. So there's quite a distance there. If we were to, like, sketch in, like, a an ideal part load curve where our power matched our capacity, so all this difference here is kind of wasted energy. So now let's uh, let's look at the right half of this screen and talk about desiccant dryer regeneration. So desiccant dryers use typically use some compressed air and maybe some electric heat and possibly a blower to regenerate the wet tower on the dryer. So we got a dry tower that's uh, drying the air and then we have a, a wet tower that's being regenerated. 
It's having the moisture driven out of it, getting it ready so we can use it again on the next cycle. And many desiccant dryers have energy saving controls that basically match the regeneration with the moisture load. If you don't have energy saving controls or you have them bypassed, then the dryer just constantly regenerates regardless of the moisture load. Now, these moisture sensors will all fail at some point. They, they're not super duper robust and they seem to have a life of, you know, two to seven years or something like that before they all fail. And what you have to do to keep the dryer working is you have to bypass the energy saving mode and turn it off like you can see in all these switches. But what often happens is people then just kind of forget about it. They don't get the sensor repaired or replaced. They're just like, hey, dryer, dryer's working again, problem solved. Meanwhile, the compressors are all forced to make more air and the dryers are using more energy to regenerate. And this can go on for years and years and oftentimes will show up and the people don't even remember when it was bypassed. You know, somebody, two or three people before them put that into bypass. So what did these guys do? Well, what did they use the air for? Their single biggest air user was the purge for this dryer, this oversized dryer. Their second biggest air usage was, was normal air usage, you know, pneumatic tools and shop, shop use of compressed air, blowing off machined parts and whatnot. Uh, they also had a handful of uh, timer drains, which you know drain moisture out of tanks or drip legs, just on a fixed schedule. And this this was about 10% of their air use. And they had almost no leaks, uh, kind of an unusual system in that it was very tight. And their cost to operate this system, you know, as found, was $22,000 a year. So on what they decided to do as an upgrade was they put in two 15-horse screw compressors that used load-unload control, and they put in a 2,500-gallon tank. They also they changed out their uh, timer drains with uh, no air loss drains. And they also, you know, they changed out their dryer for a refrigerated dryer. And this total project was, you know, $55,000. So not a cheap project, especially considering, you know, we're just making shop air here. This is not a massive industrial operation. But this brought their electrical costs uh, down $15,000 a year. So even before any utility participation, you know, this had a three, three and a half year pay, simple payback just on energy savings alone. And then with the utility participation, it was even, even more attractive to them. Now, one thing that I think is interesting is these guys could have simply, you know, tried to clean up the operation of the equipment they had there. They could have used load unload control on their big 75 horse compressor. They could have added purge controls to their desiccant dryer. But they just decided, no, this is just this is oversized and mismatched, and it's kind of the wrong the wrong type of dryer here. We're just going to start over. Now, there, on that the dryer selection, their air use is was all indoors in this shop, which never really got below 50 degrees in the winter. So they didn't really need a super dry, you know, minus 40 dew point compressed air. So the refrigerated dryer saved them a bunch of purge air consumption. Uh, on, on the tank size, also that's kind of it's you know a 15 horse compressor you know probably needs a a hundred gallon tank or it might come tank mounted on a 240 gallon tank or something like that. But well, 300 a 300 gallon tank would be our normal kind of sizing recommendation. But they bought a 2,500 gallon tank. And the thinking behind this was that the, the owner wanted the compressors to be able to start, pressurize the tank, unload, and then shut off on every cycle. So they're getting kind of near perfect part load performance on that 
on these screw compressors because they're spending a fair amount of time off. And so, Steve, I'm sorry, one question. Why, why did they install two compressors? Why not just one 30 horsepower compressor? Yeah, a single 30 horsepower compressor definitely costs less than two smaller compressors, but their typical air load is able to be satisfied by a single compressor, and the second compressor just rarely operates. So this does a couple things for them. First of all, it, you know, operating smaller, the right size equipment is always more efficient. And second, it allows one of these compressors to, you know, go down and the, they're not completely out of compressed air. So, you know, that same concept can be applied about anywhere. You're always where the load changes quite a bit. If you have, you know, two to four smaller compressors, these guys can stage up and down very efficiently to match the load, whereas if you only had one huge compressor um, and your load is low, then you're going to be stuck with some big inefficiencies. I can't go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry, I was waving at Steve to ask a question, but I hadn't actually <laughs> unmuted myself, so my bad. Um, so I appreciated Steve's uh, answer to that, but I further question was why did they install screw compressors and not reciprocating compressors? So they definitely could have installed reciprocating compressors and smaller tanks, and this probably could have brought the project cost down and maybe even saved a little more energy. But screw compressors have be have continually gotten cheaper and cheaper, you know, over the last decade. Even the small screw compressors are becoming more and more cost competitive. And they and screw compressors have a longer life and lower maintenance costs. It'll probably last, you know, three or four times as long as a reciprocating compressor. So, um, Steve, I'm sorry, I have one more question, or I have a question from an audience here. Actually, two questions. Is the old 75 horsepower still hooked up? Uh, maybe it is sized for that unit. Yeah, that, that equipment and the dryer was hauled away. I, I don't know if they got some sort of a deal, a trade-in value from their new compressor supplier or what, but no, they, they got rid of that equipment entirely. Okay. Well, and one, one more question about that from an audience member. Are large storage tanks usually more cost effective than VFDs? Um, it depends where you are. If you already have compressors that are good load-unload -load compressors, then probably moving to a nice load-unload -load system and adding tanks is probably going to be your, your most cost effective option. However, if you have compressors that don't unload very well or don't unload very far, they have you know high unloaded power. I mean, there are some oil flooded screw compressors that unload to 50% or 40% power, um, whereas some of the better ones will unload to you know 18 or 20 or 22% power. If you've got a compressor that doesn't unload very far or unload very quickly, then or if you're you have a compressor that's near the end of its useful life, then you could be in a good situation where you could say, "Hey, um, let's trade out one of these older compressors for a variable speed compressor and invest less money in tanks. You still need tanks, you still need tank volume with variable speed compressors. You just don't need quite as much. Okay, so Steve, this is my this is my last question, at least on this slide. Um, you were mentioning a refrigerated dryer. So, what, what's the relationship between the the dryer and the refrigeration? Is it we're talking about a refrigerator or? Yeah. So, a refrigerated dryer is has a small refrigeration system in it, just like an air conditioner or a fridge, and it, it cools the air and removes the condensed water that drops out. And then they kind of heat up the air that's discharging uh, before it goes out to the system. And they, they heat that up with so the incoming airstream in a little regenerative section. And it might sound like it's not very efficient because we're running this refrigeration system, but actually the power that these refrigerated dryers use is quite small compared to the power that a desiccant dryer uses because desiccant dryers are going to use uh, air from the air compressor, 
or a heater or a blower or some combination. But yeah, they, they use desiccant dryers use several times the the energy to dry the air. They also give you drier air, but they just use a lot more energy to do it. So a refrigerated dryer will give you dew points in the 35 to 40 degree range. And that works great if your users are indoors. Um, but if you have users that are outdoors in the winter or that are in a cooler, you know, you have a packaging line that's in a, a cold space, uh, then you're going to need to have drier air so you don't have water appearing in your piping. So, And then you're going to have to move to a, a desiccant dryer that typically will give you about a minus 40 dew point. There, there are several kinds of desiccant dryers, but the thing to remember is they're all more expensive to buy and more expensive to operate than a refrigerated dryer. So refrigerated dryers are our friends and we, we like to see them in use wherever possible. So kind of along that same vein, um, let's say you have a bag house outside where you need to clean some bags, but I mean, you, we can't have, you know, 40 degree dew point air going out there when it's 25 degrees outside because that line's going to freeze up. But the majority of the air use is inside where the space is conditioned. So if you have a situation like that, you can install a master refrigerated dryer that dries all the air, and then just put a small desiccant dryer, you know, on the line that goes outside to that bag house. And that way we kind of have the best of both worlds, and we haven't spent a ton of uh, energy drying all of our compressed air down to a super dry level. Okay, now let's see how good your memory is. Let's think about this, uh, this shop air case study. And let's mark off which energy savings concepts these guys used. Go ahead and use your uh, markup tools. You could draw, draw a rectangle around it or use an, use an arrow or whatever you like. Yep, definitely. Right size equipment. Yeah, their equipment was just crazy oversized to begin with. Uh, right technology. Yep, definitely. On that dryer, they had the, they got a deal on it, but it was the wrong technology. Uh, minimize loads. Yeah, so the, the dryer was their biggest single air user, so get rid of, getting rid of that desiccant dryer got rid of their biggest load. Yep, and someone even got uh, the number six here, keeping idling time to a minimum. So buying that, that huge tank allowed the compressors to shut off every cycle. So that's excellent. All right, so here's another. This is a little smaller system. There's some different ideas in play here. This is a 30-horse oil-flooded screw. It has a handoff auto switch that's always kept in hand. From as long as anyone can remember, they've operated this compressor in hand. And they had a heatless desiccant dryer, and the purge air had actually been accidentally shut off to this dryer for at least three weeks since the last service visit, but the plant had, hadn't noticed any operational problems. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can see there, this compressor is modulating up around 100, almost at 130 pounds. So their users are primarily the palletizing equipment. This is on a refrigerated Steve, dock. Steve, I'm sorry. Can you go back to that last slide for a second? Um, when you when you say oil flooded screw, what does that mean? Oh yeah. So there are two basic types of screw compressors. There's oil flooded and oil free. On oil flooded compressors, some oil is injected into the rotors. Uh, this helps seal up the rotors and seal the gaps between the rotors and the housing. And the oil also absorbs a lot of the heat, actually most of the heat of compression. And after the air is compressed, our air is going to go through a sump or an oil separator where the, you know, a coalescing element hopefully 
scrubs all the oil out of the airstream so the oil can be reused in the compressor and then the, the air goes off to an after cooler and then to you know filters and the dryer and off to our users. Now oil free compressors don't inject any oil they just have the rotating screws there with uh, just air going through them and so consequently they don't have a sump or an oil separator. Now as we discussed earlier, if we do all of our compression, if we go from zero pounds to 100 pounds all at once, we're going to get temperatures, we're going to get air temperatures of like 500 degrees. So consequently, oil flooded screws are, are most commonly two stage. And so the first stage will compress the air to, uh, you know, 20 or 30 PSI. And then the air will go through an intercooler where it gets cooled down and some moisture stripped off. And then the air goes into a second stage, another pair of screws that compress it all the way up to 100 PSI or whatever you need. So there's no oil in the compression process at all, and there's just inherently less risk of getting contaminants into the air supply. And often if you're making medical parts or, you know, microchips or something like that, you will run a, an oil-free system. and there are some food processors that run oil free and there are some food processors processors that run oil flooded so you see you see both there so the big downside of oil free compressors is cost they cost you know roughly twice as much as an oil flooded compressor thank you beth for getting me back on track so. so what these guys did is they operated this compressor in automatic mode and they put a big sign by it to make sure that everybody knew, look, this guy runs in auto, not in hand. They also reduced the load and unload pressure settings to match their needs. This palletizing equipment really only needed about 90 PSI. So they, they brought their pressure settings down quite a bit. And this didn't really cost him anything. On the next service visit, when the technician was out there, they just told him what they wanted, and he set it up, and they were done. You know, it probably took him 10 or 15 minutes to get this tuned up. And this saved them $3,300 a year. And they're also considering a refrigerated dryer, because they, they accidentally ran a test when that dryer, when their desiccant dryer was valved off, and they didn't have any problems, you know, they didn't have uh, moisture problems or moisture-related problems, and so they're wondering if they really need that desiccant dryer, or if a refrigerated dryer would would work. Steve, I have a question from a, a participant. How is the heat purged in OFA? So, uh, how is the heat purged? Oh, how is the heat purged in oil-free air? I, I get it now. Thank you. Okay, so in oil and an oil-free air compressor, uh, the air compressor at the end of each stage of compression will be 200 or 300 degrees. And in the intercooler, you're going to have air or water uh, running through a heat exchanger, and and that's going to cool your your airstream down. So your airstream is going to quickly drop, you know, from 300 degrees back to 70, 80, 90 degrees before it goes into the next stage of compression. Yeah. So if you got a three-stage centrifugal, it's you know the same idea. It's going to get really hot in the first stage. You're going to drop it back down. If you know if you're using 75 degree tower water, you might end up with you know 80 or 85 degree air going into your second stage. Your second stage, your air gets heated up again, goes into another intercooler, gets cooled back off, goes into your third stage, gets compressed even further and heated up another time, goes into an after cooler. So all that heat ends up in uh, you know, cooling water or air in the case if you have an air-cooled uh, screw compressor. If I didn't get your question, ask another one. I Thank you for that, though. Okay, so with load on load control on screw compressors, we can, and I think we already touched on this, if we have a good setup 
and good compressors that unload well, we can have a very nice part load curve. You see this compressor uses you know, about 20% power when it's fully unloaded. And it looks like there's a fair amount of tank volume here because this line is nearly straight. So pretty efficient operation across a wide range of capacity. Now if I have a compressor that doesn't unload very far, it holds say 25 or 30, well, say 40 or 50 pounds in the sump when it's unloaded, it might still use 50% power even if it's been unloaded for five minutes. And if I don't have much tank volume, it's going to cause the compressor to cycle quickly and it's going to give me, you know, not a very good part load performance. It might be a little bit better than inlet modulation down here on the low end, but on the upper end it might actually be about the same as inlet modulation. So thinking back to these, to this 30-horse uh, compressor running a palletizer and the changes they made, what do these guys do to save energy? Go ahead and mark this, mark this page up. Yep, definitely number two, use your best part load option. The compressor already had these controls. It already could use load unload control. They just needed to use that. And number five, optimize the pressure settings. Exactly. They don't need 129 pound air. They just need to keep it above above 90. So that's, that's excellent. Yeah, number 10, make the most of your controls, right? Very good. All right, so let's talk about a textile processing plant. These folks were running a single, kind of a large variable speed, oil flooded screw compressor. And this compressor operated alone almost always, almost never needed a second compressor. And the discharge pressure was set at 110 pounds. They had a really nice cycling refrigerated dryer so the cycling dryers, you know, they use power kind of in proportion to the, the moisture load. So that's, that's a great dryer. And they had a flow controller, and they were holding a, a steady downstream pressure at 90 pounds. And they had a lot of tank volume. So tanks all over the place, plenty of tanks. Their users were a, a variety of this textile processing equipment. And it was not particularly pressure sensitive, you know, 85, 90 pounds was fine to keep everybody happy. And probably just slightly behind their actual users was leak flow. During lunch breaks and other, you know, downtimes, you could walk through the production floor and just hear hissing all over the place. These leaks were very easy to find and there was lots of them. They had, you know, all the equipment they had purchased, they had purchased with just hose barb fittings where you just basically just shove a tube onto this little barb fitting. And these are kind of notorious for having a high initial leak rate and, you know, really high leak rates at, you know, one, two, and five years. So their operating costs, you know, as found was about $86,000 a year to make the electricity for this compressor. Now, this variable speed compressor already has, you know, a pretty fancy part load performance curve here. So all they really needed to do was to just find some way of just knocking their air use down and it would just, the power would just fall automatically. And so the upgrades they went after were some, uh, they changed, well, first of all, they just went after these leaks in general. But they found some problem areas where they were just chronically leaking, and they upgraded these areas to another style of uh, tubing fitting, a double ferrule type fitting that has you know much lower leak rates and much longer life uh, without developing leaks. They also did a test where they said, "Hmm, I wonder if this flow controller is you know actually helping us." And so they did a test where they set the discharge pressure 
setting of the compressor at 94 pounds, which after filter and, and pressure losses gave them about 90 pounds plant air pressure like they had before. And what they found was is that uh, none of the users were, seemed to be impacted. There were no complaints and no problems. And so that basically allowed them to take the compressor discharge pressure down 16 pounds, which, uh, you know, saves, you know, our rule of thumb would tell us that saved about 8% of compressor power. So through that pressure change and getting the leaks, you know, down to a reasonable level, that saved them about $22,000 a year. So a nice little project there. Yeah. Steve, when would you need a flow controller? Okay, a flow controller is uh, basically a big fancy pressure regulator, and I've got a, a picture, there's a picture one over here. And basically what that allows to happen is it allows the pressure upstream of it to vary, and it holds the downstream pressure very steady. And so commonly these might be used with like load unload compressors where we have two or three or four load unload compressors that are starting and stopping and loading and unloading at let's say 100 to 120 pounds so on the before my flow controller i have kind of this wide range of pressures but downstream of my flow controller i could have that set at you know 95 pounds or 90 pounds and it would hold that pressure very steadily and that can have, that has the benefit of keeping my line pressure uh, low and steady. Uh, steady kind of helps, steady can help users just perform more consistently. And by keeping it as, at the lowest possible level, it just kind of keeps leaks, you know, it keeps unregulated leak flow and unregulated user flow kind of minimized. And if, again, if you need, want a little more clarification, feel free to ask. So, so with this textile plant, what did these guys do to save some energy? Which concepts were in play on this this case study? Yeah, minimize loads. So the leak load was a real big hitter. Yeah. And in this case the flow controller wasn't benefiting them, so you know, getting that out of play and just letting the variable speed compressor control the pressure saved them some energy, allowed them to, you know, optimize their pressure settings. So yeah, those are all those are great answers. So Let's move to uh, a beverage bottling plant. So these guys have a very big system, 4,000 horsepower, great controls, uh, but they also have some users that that were eventually upgraded. And so some of these users were some, some air-powered vibrators using 50 CFM of air. Some vacuum generation was using you know, 284 CFM of air. Uh, nine Vortex cabinet coolers were using about 117 CFM of air and uh, uh, leaks in some packaging lines. Of course, everybody has those. So. so what they went after was they replaced these uh, the air-powered vibrators with electric. And the electric units just used 10%, just a small fraction of the power compared to the compressed air powered units. And so that saved all 50 CFM. And they also upgraded the uh, vacuum generators in these packaging and palletizing units. So these newer style generators, uh, when the vacuum is not needed, they shut off the air and not the vacuum. They also had an auto shut off feature so that when it had pulled a deep enough vacuum, it would, it would stop consuming compressed air. And a, the grand total they ended up with about 144 uh, CFM of savings through the vacuum generators. Now they also found that these Vortex cabinet coolers weren't weren't giving them the temperature reduction 
that they should have been. And so they cleaned these guys out and they added some thermostats. Uh, now most newer Vortex coolers are coming supplied with thermostats, but we, you can still find some older ones out there that are just always in cooling, always, always using compressed air. They also installed some automatic isolation valves on these packaging lines so that when the line went down, the air supply to the whole line got shut off automatically. We didn't have to wait for, you know, we didn't have to count on an operator to remember to shut off. And that ended up totaling, you know, 125 CFM of savings. So grand total, we dropped 373 CFM of flow. And because they had good compressor controls, the, the flow reduction translated, you know, immediately to power reduction. And they ended up, you know, saving about $28,000 a year on a $31,000 project. So, you know, they got their money back in a year, a little, little bit over a year. So very good, very good project. All right, back to our friend, the concept list. Which concepts did these guys take advantage of? Yep, minimize loads. They, this, this is all about getting users off of compressed air or figuring out how to use less compressed air. Right, and yeah, using the right technology to use less compressed air or no compressed air. Excellent. All right, on to an auto parts manufacturer. So these guys have three 500 horse centrifugal compressors. And during the week, two of these guys run and one is base loaded and the other is, is usually blowing off. And on the weekends, uh, one compressor is running and it's also blowing off. Now, screw and reciprocating compressors are positive displacement units, but centrifugals are kind of a different beast altogether. They're more akin to like a centrifugal water pump than they use, you know, high speed impellers to, uh, pressurize the air to energize and pressurize the air. And centrifugal compressors really come into their own. They come into their prime somewhere around 400 horsepower and above where they start to cost less than screw compressors. Now centrifugals have really good full load performance and they generally have lower maintenance costs and they make oil free air. So these are all some, some good pros. But the the big drawback they have is their part load performance. So they can turn down efficiently at the top end of their range. They can drop to maybe 70 to 80% capacity fairly efficiently using you know, inlet butterfly valves or inlet guide vane control. But if you need less air than that, they just have to open up a blow off valve and just throw away some compressed air. Now, if they were to try and just further close the inlet valves, then the compressor would surge. So there's kind of a minimum amount of air that these compressors have to process so that they don't surge. And so you're stuck with this minimum flow rate. So anywhere between, you know, zero and, you know, we'll say, you know, about 75% capacity, you know, their, their efficiency is suffering maybe very badly you know, the lower and lower capacity you're operating at. Uh, also, centrifugal compressors can also operate unloaded. Uh, it, people don't very commonly operate centrifugals like load unload like an oil-free screw. It has been done, but it's not very common. But typically compressors will be unloaded, you know, while they're waiting to shut off or something like that. And, and they don't use very much power when they're unloaded. So users here, they got a lot of bag houses. These guys are, are averaging 175 CFM of air consumption. And these are just constantly cleaning the bags. And they also had a particular, particularly pressure sensitive distant user that was fed by a very, very long one inch pipe and ha ended up having a large pressure drop, which was forcing them to operate you know, up at 115 pounds discharge pressure back at the compressor room. So this is costing them $378,000 to operate for a year. 
So what they decided to do was to, ins to upgrade all the controls. So they put brand new control panels on each compressor, and they also installed a supervisory control system that basically reaches in and tells those compressors what to do, tells the control panels what to do. And this allows them to modulate all of the operating compressors simultaneously. And it also will test and see if it can shut down a second compressor when possible. So if, I mean, one potential operation, let's say I need 1.8 compressors worth of, or what, let's say we, I need 1.6 compressors worth of air. That's a good prime example. I could have one compressor at full load, and I could have the other compressor blowing off. And that's how they had always done it previously. That's how the system would have operated, you know, base and trim. But with their new system, it would basically operate two compressors, you know, in this, re in this range. So they're both kind of in their efficient turndown range. Uh, it, the, the control system also rotates through, you know, who's, which compressor is the next to start to prevent too frequent of motor starts and things like that. So what these guys ended up doing was going after uh, the baghouse pulse controls. Instead of just cleaning these baghouses, these baghouse bags all the time, they added basically some uh, differential pressure sensors that stops the pulsing when the bags are clean. So it kind of has a start pressure and a stop pressure, and it's measuring the differential pressure across the bags. And that ended up saving them, you know, 110 CFM. Uh, they also installed a two-inch line in parallel with that one-inch line, and that allowed them to reduce their pressure set point by, you know, 13 psi here, you know, from 115 to 102. So that has some direct implications. It also has kind of some indirect implications. Is that when all the line pressure is lower? all the leaks leak a little bit slower. And so that's a, an artificial demand savings there. So this was not a cheap project of $178,000 for all these control upgrades and the piping. And the savings were about $74,000 a year. But, you know, with some utility participation, you know, it ended up being attractive and they, they did the project. So here's our last shot. Let's let's mark off what these guys did to take advantage to clean up their system. Yep, minimize loads on the bag house cleaning. Use your best part load option. The controls upgrade allowed them to, you know, do this a simultaneous trimming. Uh, the minimize pressure drops, optimize pressure settings. Yep, keep idling time to a minimum. The control system does that. Yep, I can, yep, those are all, those are great. So let's talk about where you can get some help. Compressed air is kind of a big world into itself, and PGE can help you get some uh, free consultation. If you're a commercial customer, you can contact Paula Conway. If you're an industrial customer, you can contact Darren Spencer. And if you're not a PGE customer, you can contact your local utility for available resources. So to sum up, compressed air is really cool. It's really versatile and it can do almost anything, but it's kind of it's got a kind of a fatal flaw in that it's fundamentally inefficient. So we want to use it carefully, and we want to make it efficiently. And with that, I will hand it back to Beth. Thank you, Steve. Before we proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar, I'd like to remind everyone that you can still submit questions to me through chat, and I'll ask some of Steve right now. Um, the first question it looks like we have here, Steve, is, what is the difference between a pressure regulator and a flow controller? Uh, it's just kind of the quality 
of the unit. Um, a flow controller is just a pressure regulator, but they're very fast acting and they're very precise. So that's the big difference is how quick, how quickly they can act and how precise they are. And also if, I mean, sometimes people on smaller systems will just use a, you know, just a smaller pressure regulator on a small system to act as a flow controller. But oftentimes, uh, the cheaper units will, it'll require five or ten pound difference across the, the valve there for it to even function. So, a few different differences. Great, thanks Steve. And the next question we have is, um, I'm about to buy an oil-free screw compressor with VFD. Is that a good idea? Yeah, that's a great question. So, oil-free screw compressors, I'm going to, I'm going to make our part load performance. So if this is uh, if this is capacity and this is power, I'll just use the units here. This is kilowatts. So oil-free screw compressors, when they unload, they don't have a sump to blow down. So the 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 power immediately falls to a very low power. It's typically you know 18 to 23, 24 percent, and it falls there very quickly. And so you basically have these two operating points at 100% load and 0% load, and the compressor just alternates back and forth between them. And that's a pretty good operation. Um, now, if you have a variable speed compressor, uh, so so here's our here's our part load performance of a of a fixed speed compressor. Now, if you have a variable speed compressor, you're going to lose a little bit of efficiency at the top end because the way I have to you have to put my power through this VFD that's not perfectly efficient, so there's a little bit of power loss there, and and then it's going to be it's going to be slightly more efficient through the you know middle and lower range of the compressor. So there there there's definitely some energy savings, but it's not huge, and so people still install both technologies. I mean, there's some people that are that really like the variable speed units, and some people still are buying you know, load unload and getting, you know, pretty good part load performance out of them. The one advantage of the variable speed unit is that when you're in the speed range, you know, if you're between 35 and 100 percent capacity, it's going to provide you a steady pressure, whereas a fixed speed compressor is going to be, you know, loading and unloading across, a, you know, a, a nominal 10-pound band. So yeah, there's there's kind of two right answers there. I don't think you could go terribly wrong either way. Thanks, Steve. And it looks like we're all out of time, but I do have a couple more questions. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments before you log off to complete our survey, um, I would really appreciate it. We do use your um, feedback to improve future webinars. And then we'll just, I'll just continue asking some additional questions and then log, we can log off. Um, Steve, what are the names of manufacturers of flow controllers? Would you be able to list a couple for some of our participants? Um, uh, uh, Pneumatech, Air Science, uh, Ingersoll Rand. I'm sure Atlas Copco makes one. I, I think most of the major air, most of the major, all the major vendors are going to have a product line that they sell of flow controllers. So, yeah, I bet anyone you ask that sells compressed air equipment can can quote you at least one. Well, thanks, Steve. Um, that was our last question. I want to thank all of you for joining us today.